everybody welcome to another episode of the lit rpg podcast episode number 160 of the show that's right we made it all the way to 160 episodes i'm ramon mejia i'm here to bring you the latest lit rpg news reviews and of course author interviews and this week i have six new lit rpg reviews just for you folks at home and this week that includes for the loot a uh, little game lit adventure the good guys book number four uh, after that i'll be reviewing quest accepted xp unlocked book number one a little bit fantasy series after that will be code of the necromancer a little bit series book number two now this is actually the one that dick davis wrote that's a fantasy setting i uh, will talk about how how it stood up to the first book in that series after that it's going to be oculus saga online book number one this is from the good folks from portal books after that, it'll be Hunter's Choice, a Lit RPG adventure, Apex Chronicles book number two. And then it's going to be Void Legend, a Lit RPG game lit saga, the Frost Files book number one. So all those and all those and, of course, much more information. Well, we're going to begin the show, though, with, the, with Lit RPG news. And in Lit RPG news, we're going to begin with... Uh, Shadow Sun Survival. Actually, this is a story about Dave Wilmarth. He has an upcoming book coming out in March. Um, it did undergo a slight name change. Apparently, there was already uh, a fantasy series called the uh, Dark, sorry, the Dark Sun uh, series or something. Uh, and so they rushed out. Like, hey, you know what? Rather than go through the issues of like potential trademark stuff or copyright things, just change out that name a little bit. Same story, same concepts, it's all there, but it is going to be titled uh, Shadow Sun Survival now. So if you noticed it, great. If you didn't, it's not a big deal. The, uh, it'll still be out on March the 5th, uh, and I definitely look forward to, to giving you a chance to read it myself. Uh, another little RPG news, Jeffrey Falcon Logan, author of the Slime Dungeon Chronicles, has been working on a slime platform video game based on his little RPG world. He announced this week that he is almost done with the next demo which apparently is going to have a new boss in there. Um, also that he set up social media for the game project. So if you want to follow on Twitter, on Patreon, um, on Instagram, apparently. Um, I'm not really into Instagram, but those are the ones kind of. <laughs> um, he set up social media accounts and you can have a link in the show notes for you guys to check it out. Uh, but I played the first demo of that game and it was actually kind of fun. It really was neat to know the guy who made it. Uh, it's an actual like legitimately fun game with mazes and puzzles i don't think i got through all the puzzles personally i and it took me quite a few tries to beat that first boss to be honest um but it's it's a little bit fun it's a little empty in some places because it's the demo it's not fully flushed out obviously uh, but i definitely encourage you to go check it out um jeffrey Rock and logan also has a huge uh youtube page where he shows off videos for this stuff and on our uh, youtube channel for the uh, liberty podcast keep us podcast a youtube page we actually have a, a video of me playing that game if you want to go check it out as well uh, but definitely go support the author if you like his games and books um speaking of ways to support your authors uh daniel schienhofen has announced this week that he finally got a merchandise page set up so he's selling t-shirts hats with images and logos of his various novel properties if you want to go buy them check them out uh there's not a huge selection at this point um but some of them are popular enough that they're sold out already, so that's that's good. Um, I don't. So this is mostly just for fan stuff. Some of it's a little expensive, but again, it's it's really just for fans. It costs money to <laughs> produce these. Some of these also might be um, print on demand, uh, so there might be a little bit of a, a time issue of like getting them on. But they're there. If you want to go support them? Go to his web link in the show notes. It's sheenhoffenbooks.com. Sheenhoffenbooks sorry dot myshopify.com. So you go check it out. Um, Speaking of supporting people, uh, we actually have a, there's a new Lit RPG reviewer, uh, Lavelle Jackson, on YouTube who publishes under the name Lit RPG Reroll. And I just want to give a shout out to the reviewer. Um, he's not affiliated with the Lit RPG podcast and animation perform, um, but he's someone else who's reviewing Lit RPG. So I, I, I want to support a, a fellow reviewer and a fellow fan of Lit RPG. Um, it's it's oddly hard to make time to, to read and put your thoughts coherently together in a review and then to video it and upload it. There's a whole like dedication of time and effort. Um, and I know that cause I do it obviously. Um, but the, uh, the, 
but Lavelle has has done a good job of like being consistent. Uh, he's only done a few reviews so far, um, and I'm sure he plans to do more. But I just want to wish him luck and encourage him to keep putting up those video reviews because again, putting out regular content is is you know it's a part time job sometimes. Uh, so I def- but I always want to encourage folks who have the passion who and who were willing to put their face out there to do this kind of stuff. The, w- the best of luck and i wish them well uh we'll have a link in the show notes for his youtube page but again that'll be lit rpg reroll so there you go okay um in other lit rpg news we have mountain Dew press is taking submissions for an anthology set in the divine dungeon universe there's a bunch of details you uh about it and you're not to be aware of some of them including the deadline for submissions of march 25th um but this is a chance to write in your favorite story universe if you like that universe of course uh the universe is written by dakota kraut who's the who's the um head guys at Mount no press. I'm not sure what his official position is, so I don't want to say it, but he, he runs the company. It's his and his wife's company. Um, some of the details for, for the rules for the submissions are um, there's going to be a total of four stories besides Dakota's uh, that'll be selected for the anthology. Stories must be between eight and 12,000 words. Stories must be original. Authors are limited to one submission each. Stories must fit within the established world. Um, stories must follow a character C rank or below, one that you create or is a canon character. So apparently you can re- cast a lot about canon characters, but they must be limited to their backstory, which in these terms means that um, their backstory before the first Divine Dungeon series book. Um, so stuff, nothing that's going to essentially like break or like contradict uh, the established um, story stuff. And so there you go. Uh, also stories must have little to no sexual content um, because these stories are set in the divine dungeon world. Unacceptable submissions cannot be published for monitoring compensation or any form of any form by the author. So essentially if you're submitting this, you can't go publish it somewhere else and say, Oh, this is a divine dungeon story. Uh, you know what I mean? So that's, that kind of makes sense to me. Um, story should have a strong, a strong ending. So no cliffhangers. Uh, and there's some other details about it. Um, how they're, how they're going to sort through the, the submission process and decide who, who, who goes through. Um, and of course, all the terms are, are in the links in the show notes. They also have a link to the, to where you can submit your story. Uh, now this is me speculating here a little bit more. Um, it, this, I think that this might be the way that Mount Press is going to be checking out talent for an expanded universe, potentially of storylines. Um, recently publishers of reading it online, the, uh, shadow Alley press, um, did kind of the same thing to be honest. They put out a, a call for anthology submissions. They put those submissions together and they kind of saw how they played out. If there was going to be an audience for, for expanded universe content potentially. Um, and then essentially they started publishing expanded universe content. They have a whole, like three whole new series by original authors with original characters set in the Viridian Gate Online universe. Um, and they've worked really hard to make sure that their, their content is in line with, with the universe. Um, and, and it seemed to be working out pretty well. They have two out now. They have a third coming out in the future. And then they're going to be cycling like every two or three months. A new one, of something from one of those series or the original video game online series will be out. So that they're going to have a lot more content coming out every single year. Uh, something that in just the video universe that puts it out like 12 books, 12, 13 books every year. Uh, in that universe because they're having other authors do work, of course. Um, and I think that's might be what Mountain Dew Press is potentially doing in the future. And if so, I'm happy to to hear that that's the case. I, I really enjoy that universe. I love the Divine Dungeon series and the way it's going. Uh, and so I'm happy to see more good content come up. But that's kind of the challenge of making it good, making sure authors are, are consistent, that there's no you know issues with continuity. Uh, and I know that's, like, that's an extra challenge. So um, if that's the way that they're going, Great. I'd love to see more, but folks for you at home, if you want just to write something and you're a fan or you're an author who wants to, you know, get some, um, get a leg up in having an established universe to work in, this might be just up your alley. So there you go. So we'll have a link in the show notes again for all those details if you want to check it out. Okay. Uh, last bit of Litter PG news. Uh, I recently interviewed Dan Sugralinov. Sugralinov. They sent me like, I, I kept messing it up so badly that I actually had, they told me how to do it and I wrote it down so that I wouldn't forget later. Um, but Dan uh, is the author of the Level Up series. I did an author interview with him last week, um, and I, I ended up editing it down so that the translation portions are a little smoother. Um, I actually ended up editing it like a whole half hour, like it's half hour shorter than the original unedited version because I basically layered the translation stuff. So like the author would say something that needed to be translated in the original version, and then the translator would go afterwards. And in the new version, it's just layered under so that you hear the translation as the author is speaking. I think it feels a little smoother. You guys can let me know if you 
if that feels better for you. Uh, but it also came out as the Little Bitty Podcast episode number 159 of the show. So you might have already seen it. But it was a really well fun interview. Um, it was an insightful conversation about the author. Uh, we talked about Dan's writing process, how he balances writing and family time, inspiration for his stories. And there was a really cute... A personal story for him where he's like as a kid in russia we didn't have all the lord of the rings like they only translated the first two books for some reason and so as a kid he wrote the third book like for real it was like he, he said he wrote the third book and all of his friends and, and family who read it thought it was super amazing and and sometimes even better when, uh, than the actual third book when it came out but that kind of shows hey, that he's been a lifetime writer. And there's a bunch of like fun stories that, that are in the author event that I <laughs> highly encourage you to check out because it's a good author and his, his English is pretty good. He, again, he's only been, I guess, learning English or been in America for like six months. So he speaks much better English than I'm ever going to speak Russian. So good on him. Um, and he actually also sent a written response to all the pre-interview questions I sent him, which nobody ever does. Um, so, you can actually read some answers to questions that I never ended up asking as well. If you, if you check out the links in the show notes to the Little RPG Podcast episode number 159. So there you go. And that's Little RPG News. Uh, on to stuff that is out now. I uh, haven't had a chance to read, but it is out now. Uh, that includes Reading Gate Online, Firebrand. This is one of those expanding universe novels. Um, also out is uh, Cat's Quest. Um, it is a translation of a, uh, a Russian novel. Um, Dan, I was talking to him, I actually mentioned that this was coming out, and he said he liked this, the novel, so I'm um, definitely looking forward to getting a chance to read it at some point. Uh, also out, this one is already doing so amazing, Awaken Online, Book 4, Dominion. Um, as of like this reading on Amazon, it's like number uh, 58, I think, on Amazon's uh, publishing charts, so it's already doing super well, so good on you, Travis Bagwell. Um, I really do love the cover. Like I like the color scheme. It's a good contrast with the white and black, so really nice. Um, also out right now is Small Medium at Large by Andrew Sipple. This is the author of the um, Threadbare series. This is actually a novel set in that same universe, just with a different main character. And you're going to see some a little bit of crossover stuff, at least from book one. Uh, we'll have to see what book two does. Also out is uh, Crafting, uh, The Crafting of Chess, a little RPG adventure uh, cover art. Not that amazing and that not that doesn't tell you much but it is it is a literary story i had a chance to check it out just to look over it more quickly um have a had a chance to read through the whole thing but it is it is actually a little g um also out is super mage rise to omniscience omniscience uh, book number one so that is out also it is the third book of the nora online series uh and the second oh, sorry the third book in the black flame online series um so there you go those are out if you if you like those stories if you like that that series it's out for you to read if you like it uh out in new lit rpg audiobooks the whole slew of stuff out as well as audiobooks including endless online oblivion's blade uh that is the first book in that series go check it out it, it was enjoyable for me um also out is merchant of tikpa book two the bathroom night book number five that's right it's the second book in the merchant tikpa series and it's technically the fifth book in the bathroom night series written by charles dean um so it is out as an audiobook as well, folks. So go check it out. Uh, Sentence to Troy. A lot of people really like the ebook version of this. I'm hoping that the uh, audiobook version is is as entertaining, if not more so. Um, so that is out as an audiobook as well. And also the anthology series I mentioned earlier from Brooding Online and um, Shadow Valley Press. That's actually out as an audiobook. That took a really took like a substantial amount of effort to come as an audiobook because there are so many stories, so many characters. Um, Sunday with Theater did the work on that, and then they have a whole roster of well-known audiobook narrators, including Jess Hay, Jeff Hayes, Justin Thomas, uh, James, Lori, Catherine Winkle, uh, Annie Alicott. Uh, all those folks are you know engaged in the like the five or six short stories that are there. Uh, so I actually plan to do a review of that for the Little Bridge Audiobook Podcast because um, the host of that show um, is one of the people who's there. Raymond Johnson uh, is you know he's a part of the Liberty family and he, he, he wrote a short story. It got accepted and it's on this audiobook. So definitely go check that out. And I'll be doing a review because he felt it was a conflict of interest. So I'll just review the whole thing for that particular show. Uh, probably this next coming week. 
actually yeah okay and uh, that's it so on to upcoming loader pg this is just where i read off a bunch of stuff that i know it's coming out there are a few new additions and a few new date changes in here so but you can skip it if you don't want to listen to it obviously um on march the 5th it'll be the black turtle the second book in the atar chronicle series march the 5th as well sh- the uh, shadow sun survival the one from david marth on march the 14th it'll be the f- Another expanded universe VGO novel called Vindication, the Alchemic Weaponer. On March the 18th, it'll be Absolute Zero, Adam Online, book number one. On March the 25th, the third book from Dan uh, Sugrel Enough. Uh, in the Level Up series, it'll be The Final Trial. On March 27th, The Dark World Transformation, book number two. March 28th is another Viridian Lines expanded universe novel. The second book in the Illusionist series called Viridian Airline, Dead Man's Tide. On April the 1st, it'll be Into the Game, Dungeon Crawl Quest. Um, April the 5th, it'll be uh, Jin Tamer, Rivals, a monster battling game lit adventure, Jin Tamer, Bronze League, book number two. <laughs> On April the 10th, it'll be Edge of the Abyss, Respawn Trials, book number one. On April the 11th, it'll be Dukes and Ladders, uh, the Good Guys series, book number five. On... April the 16th, Soul Catcher, Liberty Series, Universe, ICS, book number one. On April the 18th, Dragon Heart, Stone Will, Lit RPG, Waxia, Wuxia Series, book number one. And another book from Dan Sugulainov, <laughs> it'll be out on April 22nd, uh, Class A Threat and the Discardian book. We actually talked about this This is a, um, book in the author interview with him quite a bit. Um, I have to say, I was he, he describes it much differently than the cover art and the novel they do. And I'm, I'm honestly much more excited now that I've actually talked to him and talked to him about what this book actually is about um, than I was just looking at this cover because the cover does not do it justice, apparently. Um, so just, just letting you guys know. Um, also, another thing to watch the interview about him, hear him describe this new series. Uh, on April 25th, In Search of the Oldens, Galacticon book number two by Vasily Mahenko. Uh, and there you go. That's it. That's all the stuff for, that I know coming out all the way up until April. On to uh, new releases and reviews, folks. And new releases and reviews. We're going to begin our show with uh, four. The Loot. Uh, it's going to be the Liturgy Game Lit Adventure Good Guys, book number four by Eric Ugland. So there we go. It is 312 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. And here's the author's description Montana Cockshell, Duke of Cockshell, Defeater of Dungeons, he of far fewer intelligence points that is probably recommended, is finally ready to start building his dukedom. He just needs one more thing before he can leave Osterdad. A few hardworking friends who join him on his adventure. Well, and some lumber, and nails, and what's not, and enough food to get through the winter, and probably some more gold. All Montana needs before he can leave Ostrad are some friends, some building material, food, and money. So there you go. But he did promise to retrieve some magic text from a cemetery for Emmeline, and he really should try to help that lost little boy who keeps following him around. And all the undead in the basement crypt aren't going to re-kill themselves. Uh, maybe Montana's take on a few too many taken on a few too many side quests and that's all the novel description so there you go <laughs> um and i think that uh, novel strategy does a really good job of not only telling you what's exactly in the story but also giving you a hint at the um flavor and the novel and the sense of humor there all the great things that i've really enjoyed so far um this is a really short review just because i've enjoyed every single one of these novels from book one to book four now um and and i keep saying the same stuff about how engaging it is how good the world building is um how the story mechanics go i'll note here that in this particular novel the stats and the rpg stuff is more minimalized than the the other stories um but i really still had a good time with that I, i i've already kind of fallen in love with the world a little bit and the characters and i'm already i'm good for the entire ride um i would love to see more rpg mechanics and more like stats and those kind of um progression parts in the future personally um but for now this is still good it's still a little bg because the main character does gain progressive power it's just not a lot unfortunately um but there are um good action adventure scenes there's good questing um and now there's some town building um that is actually going to happen it's a little more later in the story so don't worry if you don't see in the front front half of the story but it is there and there is some actual helping so and but it is slice of life and so you're just following a guy 
doing adventure stuff and now with some town building. So there you go. For me, it gets to score 7.5 out of 10. Uh, that's for the loot. The Liberty Game Loot Adventure, the Good Guy series, book number four with the score 7.5 out of 10. Easy review. Okay, on to our next review, which is going to be Quest Accepted, XP Unlocked, book number one, a Liberty Fantasy series written by J.S. Grilke. It is 377 pages, $3.99. It is available on Kindle Limited, and here's the author's description. Getting in was easy. Getting out will be the challenge of, of their lives. Trapped on opposite ends of an immersive virtual reality fantasy game world, Evan and his sister Auden embark on a quest where their choices they make can tip the scales of life and death. Their only hope in, lies in learning magic, crafting skills, and forming unlikely alliances to confront an evil intent on destroying them. The must rely on the power they find both within the world and themselves to survive before they are locked in forever. And that how description almost has nothing says nothing about Lord PG or Gamelin. Like you wouldn't know from either the aside from the cover art or from the description of this is a little bit of story. Um it is lit RPG though, but um that also kind of reflects part of the issues I had with this particular novel. Um it's it's a miss for me. That's the easy portion of this review. Um there are portions I liked it, but of course, but on the whole, it just didn't work for me. Doesn't mean it's a bad novel. Doesn't mean it's even boring. It's just there are aspects for it that stopped it from being good for me in particular. And other people might like might like it more. Um, the story for me, a lot of the plot lines felt pretty forced. The cyberpunk reasons for the main character, um, for the main characters, I should say, because there are two protagonists um, to be trapped in the game in the first place. It felt so forced, and it, there's nothing really done with it. Like besides getting them into the game world. Once they're there, there's like a few reminders here and there, like, oh yeah, we should be doing a thing. Um, and then it just, it's just, it really is just more like a slice of life adventuring stuff. And then at the very end of the story, like, like, oh yeah, by the way, that cyber thriller stuff we introduced at the beginning, here's the explanation really quick before we end. Um, and that was, it felt like it was just, it was frustrating for me as a reader. I was like, oh, okay. That, I mean, it is what it is, obviously. Um, it, it just didn't impact the story. Um, ultimately, the story is, again, a slice of life. The main characters getting trapped in a game, going adventures that kill them repeatedly um, without consequence. That bug, that, that bug the gamer inside of him. He's like, if you're going to die, if you're going to have a death mechanic, there should be some consequence to death. Um, and, and there just wasn't. Like, they never lost item. They never lost experience points. No item degradation. Um, they weren't, like, vulnerable when they died. They never had, like, a stat loss or something. There's just, like, no consequences for it. Um, although, it, I think part of it, it was, like, it was maybe this uh, joke or, like, really humorous aspect to it, maybe. Um, but either way, it's just one of those little things that bugged me. From there on, it's like this forced one plot line is, is forced on them, on the characters, and it plays out pretty predictably. The action is in the story is okay. It's not great. It's not like bad. It's just like, okay, this is pretty decent. Um, there were other aspects of the story that bothered me. Just this bugged me personally. I'm not a huge fan of multi-narrative perspective stories where it's like, oh, one main character's point of view for a little while, and then you switch to the other ones, and then you switch back and forth. Um, it's like you're telling two stories in parallel, only they're slow eventually they're going to connect with that. It's just not, it, it bugs my brain for some reason. It's the same way I couldn't read um, Game of Thrones because they do the same thing there. Uh, and it, it's just, so that's just me, of course. Uh, game mechanic wise, there are character sheets, there are stats, there are skills, levels, all the good stuff. Um, however, it doesn't feel like it mattered to, when I was reading. It really didn't. There, like I said, there's a lot of information. Like, like the author went out of his way, of course, to like, do the detail work. Um, I'm not saying that's not there, and it is a little RPG. Um, it just felt like when the main characters got increases of strength or intelligence, they didn't seem to have an appreciable impact on the actual storytelling world, like when the story's being told. The characters aren't smarter, they not really seem stronger when they get their stat, um, their, their strength stat increased. Um, there are, are notifications galore, and that's all there. It really is. And the characters acknowledge them. Um but again, I, I, part of this just is the way that the story world is set up and that there aren't damage notifications. So you can't like show through those damage notifications that, oh, increasing your strength really did have an impact on killing this monster. There's not like there's um, 
the, any kind of like sh- stuff like that shown. And the descriptions outside of combat didn't really reflect that either. Like increasing that stat scale by like 30 to 50% didn't really have an appreciable impact on what the characters were doing, could carry or let like, them being super buff. None of that was really there. So because of that, for me at least, when I was reading the story, I kind of had this like real heavy portal fantasy vibe. Um, and again, I'm not saying it's not lit RPG. It is. All that stuff is there. The author made the effort to, to put it in there. Um, but ultimately, because I never saw like an, an actual impact of those stats on like the actual storytelling, um, even in combat, it, like I said, it kind of just had this portal fantasy vibe for me. And maybe for some readers, that's really good. Like they really enjoy um, not having a, a ton of like game mechanics like mess with the story. I don't know. Um, but for me, it wasn't a good part of the story so even f- even overall th- there's a nice sense of humor here that's really good there's really decent character development um because of those reasons that i mentioned the story didn't work for me unfortunately um and again for readers who prefer more of a fantasy novel vibe to your liberty you might actually like this a lot more than me um it just didn't work for me so for me gets a score of six out of ten that's quest accepted xp unlocked book number one a liberty fantasy series with a score of six out of ten there we go Okay, on to our next review, which is going to be Code of the Necromancer, a little bit of series. Book number one, written by Deck Davis. It is, I'm sorry, it's a, not a little bit of series, it's a, is it a little bit of series or it's actually the modifies is a loot RPG series. So there you go. Um, it is the 275 pages, $2.99 that is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here is the author's description. Cast your XP. Earn, sorry, cast your spells, earn your XP, bring the dead back to life. Death fears the men who can use magic against him, but what are those guys scared of? Well, necromancers are only human, and Jacob Russo has a big heart, but a dark past, and when he's banished from the Magical Academy for failure in his first assignment, he finds himself needing new allies, new spells, and new weapons. A world of secrets and spells awaits outside of the Academy doors, and Jacob knows that one day, he'll master them all. If... He can find his own code. He'll become the most. He'll become the best necromancer who ever lived. So there you go. This is the second book in the series. Um, the author says it can be read as a standalone, but he recommends reading book one. I actually agree. Um, this not double does a really good job of like world building, even on its own, and establishing previous um, references and powers and all that good stuff. But the RPD stuff is more set up in book one. So. Um, that means that this one has like a lighter setup in the first half of the novel where there's like less litter BG stuff um, because the setup was all done in book one. So just be aware of that. Um, on to the review. This is uh, this one is even lighter on the liberty than book one and leans a little more towards fantasy. Um, I already mentioned why, because the setup for the system was done in book one and this is book two. So the author to a degree assumes you've already learned how the RPG system works. Um, this is especially true for the beginning part of the novel, which deals, deals with all the fallout from the events of book one and the setup for the intrigue thriller aspect of the story. Um, and this is again completely in line with how the magic system works in the story. The story universe with the necromancer XP only being gained when the main character uses his spells or gathers death essence. Um, there's more RPG pr- progression in the middle of the story, but it's relatively light before that. So just be aware of that. Um, still, it's an entertaining read. Um, good action, good tension, good murders, bad guys. They're all pretty bad. Um, the story gets a little dark sometimes, but there's a lot of good character development and role building. So I had a good time with him. Um, I've actually enjoyed this series, probably one, one of the best out of all the Deck Davis has done, just because this is set in a completely different world. Um, it's a fantasy RPG world. And the author is really consistent with like the RPG mechanics. Like Some authors don't like to have a ton of stuff in there, like RPG mechanics, like numbers and stats. And, and there's a balance that everybody kind of has to find. I th- think with this, with this series, the author really has found a balance that works for him and that there are details enough that it's little RPG, but it, it doesn't impact his ability to, to tell like this sort of fantasy oriented, um, storytelling. So it really, I think it was a nice balance that the authors come to. And then go with that's a score of 7.3 out of 10 for a code of the necromancer, a little bitty series book number two. So there we go. Okay, um, that is not the button I wanted to press. No, folks, the show hasn't ended. 
So it's over. Sorry. Uh, on to our next review, which is going to be The Occultist Saga Online, number one, a fantasy liturgy. It is 482 pages, $4.99 that is available on Kindle Unlimited. And here's the author's description. Damien thought his exams would be bad enough. Then his mother collapsed with a failing heart. In a desperate move, Damien throws himself into the streamer contest of Saga Online, the latest fantasy VR MMORPG. Winning will provide the funds for his mom's surgery, yet early betrayal and a close run-in with the vampire almost ruin his attempt before he begins. Stuck at the bottom of a dungeon with no gear, no allies, and little hope, Damien must embrace the undiscovered occultist class. Master control of his new demon companions and take the contest by storm. His plan is simple enough. Topple the most famous player in Saga Online. Summon your imps. Prepare for a battle. So there you go. Um, this is a pretty good action-focused focus, literary story. There's lots of good fights. A mix of player versus environment, player versus player battles, with the emphasis on PvP in the middle and lane half of the story. Um, there's some interesting summoner class stuff here with RPG progression, but nothing I haven't seen. Before. Like the, like honestly, the summoner class I've seen it um, probably four or five different times with same similar setup of like, oh, you have um, certain low level minions and you have certain middle and higher level minions and they have different abilities and, and features and you know, that none of that is interesting, but it's it's actually used really well in the story as far as like, um, using those those characters and those summon minions in different ways that are you a little bit more unique. Um, but most of the RPG stuff is, is stuff you've seen probably other places. Um, the real life storyline is probably the weakest aspect of the story. And I'll be honest, I didn't like it at all. Um, there are very f few real-life storylines that have any real impact on literary novel stories. Um, and this definitely was a weak one. Um, with the exception of like him meeting his romantic actress. That part was really done nicely. Um, but the gaming to save his sick mom aspect by winning the streaming contest competition felt like a, it was a forced plot line. And it really wasn't needed to be honest like the the game's real stuff on its own was good enough like that aspect of it was good enough to be a standalone story i don't I always understand i mean i understand on a technical level as a writer why that stuff is there um but as a reader i'm like it doesn't matter it, and it really didn't it, except for being like this this kind of weakish motivation that only kind of comes up in the story occasionally um overall though it's a good action story action imager story there's consistent game mechanics again there were a couple places that felt um, like the storyline was being forced in a particular direction, but it's not enough to ruin the story for me. Uh, there's only a couple of places, obviously. And for me overall, I had a good time with it. It really was, it, it's entertaining. It's a nice read. And again, it's very action adventure oriented. Um, so for me, it gets a score of 7.3 out of 10. That's the Occultist Saga Online book number one, a fantasy little bit adventure with a score of 7.3 out of 10. So there you go. Okay, next is a hunter's choice a liberty adventure apex chronicles book number two written by c e keen it is 437 pages four dollars 99 cents that is available on kino limited and here's the author's description it's only been a couple weeks since aris and his friends took down the nipandis queen and already their star for work if they want to test their new skills and grow stronger aris knows that they'll have to get out of their comfort zone and leave the tutorial era behind Following a lead that could help them destroy more beast frenzying crystals, Aris and his companions make their way to Iskarel. Little do they know, a dangerous beast lurks in the caverns beneath the city, gorging itself on those same crystals, threatening the lives of those above. And this creature is just beginning, is the beginning of their troubles. The world of Australia is ever evolving and Aris is starting to believe it's more than just a game. When push comes to shove, he'll have to let go of the world he knows, and exist in the moment. His friends' lives may very well depend on it. So there you go. Um, I think this novel actually works decently as a standalone novel, but you're going to obviously appreciate more gaming mechanics, more history if you read book one. Uh, but it does a really good job of quickly telling the reader about the main character, his relationships with other characters, and the game world. So that's a plus. Um, the novel is absolutely definitely heavily inspired by the monster hunter games um in that franchise and it has a very faithful feel to those games i actually went into a lot more detail in book one uh in the review for book one i should say um however the like that first book much of the action in this one takes place on those hunts as it should be if, if you're being faithful to that monster hunter franchise um when the main character and his group, and his group get a bounty they have to research it, they have to track it, they have to figure out a specific way to hunt that monster, and they struggle to fight, and they 
she usually barely win their fights. And that very, that feeling and that vibe is very much in line with the Monster Hunter franchise. Like I've played, I've only played one of those games before, uh, but looking at YouTube game or YouTube like um, play sessions and of people playing the other version of the game, they're all very much like that. Uh, and this, I think this story really does capture that vibe. It captures the essence of those stories. And it definitely pulls game mechanics from that, that are similar to those uh, franchises. I don't think it, it like violates any copyrights or anything, um, but it definitely like makes you feel like, oh yeah, this is that game I love to play. Uh, and so if you're a fan of that franchise, you're going to love this um, series. And this one continues to be faithful to that. Um, I also like the part that the main character can just die repeatedly and he sometimes has to to figure out how to beat a monster. I like that aspect as well. Um, this novel actually does some more interpersonal relationship building. Um, it develops the romance aspect a little more than book one. Um, there's some intrigue. There's also a mystery that pushes the main character in his group to new locations, which is good. Um, and overall, again, I said anybody who likes the monster franchise is going to like this. And even people who have never played those games, I think they're going to appreciate um the action in the story there's really nice world building and again there's a semi-realistic emphasis on what it would be like to be a monster hunter in an rpg world um and i think they're going to appreciate like those like small details like oh yeah you can't just go out in the world and murder a monster you have to research you have to like track it and you have to like figure out its weaknesses and plan around that it's a little more tactical than just like button mashing in it and then mmo sometimes and that's a very different game mechanic than is in those stories and and and, and some folks appreciate it. I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, and so for me, this is a good story, nice action adventure stuff. Um, gets a score of 7.4 out of 10 for me. That's Hunter's Choice, A Little Bit Adventure, Apex Chronicles, Book Number Two, had a good time with book one, had a even better time with book two with a score of 7.4 out of 10. There you go. Okay. Last review, folks, is gonna be Void Legion, a Little Bit Game Lit Saga, The Frost Files, book number one, written by Terry C. Simpson. Um, this one is 377 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited, and here's the author's description. Misfortune comes in fours for 16-year-old Andre Taylor, each one worse than the next. He had to quit school, quit gaming, and his father died. Life sucked. It couldn't get worse until a car accident left his pregnant mother in a coma and his little sister a hostage. To save them, Dre must excel at X Ataxia Online, Void Legion. And by Dre, he means the character Andre. Um, a simulated reality multiplayer online game. Now powerful factions want him dead, player killers hunt him, and a lethal plague sweeps across the land, and nightmare creatures from a void storm stand in his path. Can Dre survive against the overwhelming odds and unearthly secrets of Void Legion? Can he convince a girl who wants to duel him to death to fight on his side? He must, or a fate worse than death awaits. And he notes that there includes some profanity, um, adult themes, and graphic um, situations. So there you go. Okay. Um, this is a little bit of a novel that tries to do... It, it tries to do some different things, and some of them work, some of them don't. Um, the novel does a really good job on the aspects of the RPG sections. Um, anything related to the RPG mechanics, the um, the feeling of the main character being a gamer, um, the action scenes, all that stuff is really well done. I, I gotta say that it, it, it's good stuff on that aspect of it. Um, the other parts of the story didn't work for me in particular, and I'm gonna explain why in a minute. Um, but I wanna emphasize that this isn't necessarily a bad book, it really isn't. Um, it has some decent reviews, um, but for me, the action stuff is probably the biggest highlight, like the anything related to the class stuff. The main character is, you can see on the cover, this isn't spoilery, he gets a unique class of like being a cannoneer, um, which kind of feels like the class from um, Star Wars, I forget what it's called, Star Wars Night, not... So always the older public, or like when you had one of the stormtroopers and he had like the cannons and uh, that kind of stuff that, that definitely plays in there. So it's a unique class. It's, it's really well thought out. It has unique powers. That stuff is good. The RPG stuff is really well, nicely done. Um, I'd say that the author didn't want to deal with like damage notifications and, and like tracking that kind of stuff. Cause all that is absent intentionally from the story of like tracking hit points and seeing people's levels. Um, but beyond that, everything really feels gamer. Like the main character, um, feels like a gamer and that's a really hard to manufacture. So you can say the author's probably a gamer as well because the, there's just so many like nice little details and tactics and theories and um, RPG theorizing and game mechanic theorizing 
So good stuff there. So that all that stuff is nice. Um, but the novel still lost me. But it wasn't because of the RPT stuff. It really wasn't. It was because of the other storytelling aspects of it. Um, there's a cyberpunk, cyber thriller, um, real life storyline that I just never liked. I, I actually just liked it. Um, and I never really bought into it. And it just didn't make sense to me. Um, however, I could have ignored that if I kind of fell in love with either the world, the world or the game world. And I just never did. Um, that never happened. I, I, I it just, the way that the world building was done, did it, it kind of bothered me and it didn't really feel, um, it didn't really feel like it was done well for me at least. Um, both the real life and the game world lore and the real building always felt kind of like you can tell the author put some thought into the world he was creating. And I definitely give him kudos for that. Um, but the way it was presented, the way it was, uh, the information was told to me as the reader just didn't work for me. Like it really kind of bothered me. And I'll tell I mean, this is the way it kind of happened. The, the main character, um, most of it was very like info dumpy in that the main character would just kind of rattle off some statements um, that could have been super interesting, but they weren't because they were just kind of thrown out there. There was a bunch of names, but no context and no depth as to why these events happened. Um, and, and that always just, it just really bothered me. It was like, um, there were always like these hints of like, oh, that I would love to learn more about that, that thing you just said, um, because it, it, it gives depth to the world. And, it, and like, oh, that's, that's cool. And I just, like, at the same time, it's like, then it just moves on. It's like, oh, you just said words. And you just made statements about events that happened without giving any contextualization, without giving details. Like, oh, that's okay. And then it would move on. And, but because it was always presented that way, uh, the world building just felt flat to me. And I was like, oh, that's unfortunate because it could have been, it could have been really good. And it just didn't work. Right. I know other reviews on, on the book, they didn't care. It didn't, it didn't really seem bother for me. That's one of the things I love about lit RPG and like these fantasy worlds. Because, like you can do a lot of really cool stuff. And f for me, that just did, didn't happen here. And I'm going to give you an example. That's not going to be too short because it's just the beginning of the, it's the, beginning of the novel. Uh, for example, in the real world, um, apparently the United States doesn't exist. Uh, the United States of America. Instead, there was this civil war that happened and some foreign powers were involved and now there's two countries. And for some reason, there's an organization um, that exists in where the main character lives that controls how many kids get born. And all those things seem like they're really, like, potentially be really interesting storytelling opportunities. But instead, you never really get details about it. They're just set as statements. And then the story moves on. I'm always like, wait, what about those things? Those seem really neat. And I you know, just never got details. Of that. And it's just like, oh, okay. And so like I said, a lot of that happens in not just the world, but also with the game world. Um, and in the game world, it's even harder to like fall in love with the world or like, like feel like it's real because of the way the information is there. Not only is it like in this like info dump form, but like, oh, here's a bunch of stuff. Here's a bunch of like details um but, but in this context in the in, in the in the game world um the main character just uh he he doesn't actually let me see um how to explain to the instead of the main character gradually learning the history of the world the races the factions you know by talking to non-player characters you're doing his own research like you would in other stories um and I feel like he's, he's important. So he has to learn things. And as the main character learns things, the reader learns things, right? That's how a lot of these stories go. Um, instead, the main character automatically knows stuff. Um, he, he knows about the world's history. He knows about his, his race's history, his family's history, events of the world and all that information and all that knowledge is apparently in, in terms of the game mechanics, it's implanted in his brain, um, as a character, like his, all his character's backstory is implanted in his brain. So, when he's interacting with the world, with the game world, where there's NPCs or how he's viewing things and, and people around him, he's seeing it through, through two different lenses simultaneously. One is him as a gamer who doesn't, who's never played this version of the game. And two, though, as the character, like he, he, he sees and recognizes people and he's in the story, he's telling things and details about the people he sees and about the, his race and about the racial enemies and about um, political context. And, 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 and all that stuff is just kind of stated by the main character. Like he's suddenly recalling it. Um, and while I applaud the author for thinking of a, trying to think of a different way of, of, of telling the reader histories of the story, this didn't work, at least for me. 
um, because of the way it came across. It came across as very awkward to me, at least. Um, you lost that sense of discovery because the main character is again not. He's not learning it, so he's not like appreciating it. He's just stating facts. Um, it would be to give you a comparison is that recently I've been getting into Diablo gaming um, and like being a player. Um, and I've seen a couple of different ways that DMs like will give you information about the world. Like one, the, the DM will just, he'll kind of tell you this mini story about like details and characters and give you emotional context for it. Um, and that feels always feels like good storytelling. Other DMs or other instances, it's just like, oh, here's a list of information. And it feels like they're reading an encyclopedia paragraph about something, right? Where it's like specific about this thing, but you're not really getting contextual information about who these people mentioned are necessarily, right? It just feels like it's it's static information that's being read in a very static way. And unfortunately, when the main character is describing things he remembers, it's that second half. It's that the encyclopedia you're reading of like, oh, here's here's information, here's names, here's dates, here's you know names of people, but there's no context to it. There's no like emotional resonance for the main character. I mean, it, obviously because he's it's implied information, but still at the same time because he's not learning it on his own because he's not working um, to learn this information. He's not. Um, talking to NPCs or other characters to get this, you know, history and lore and it doesn't feel personal. It feels, it, it just, there's this dissonance because also the, the main character who, as the reader, I was like, oh, this guy couldn't have actually seen those things. Even if you're thinking like, oh, it's, it's background information on his character. Like he's a teenager. He's in this fantasy world where there's not this mass education system. So there's probably no real reason why he should know that information, but the details about those battles he wasn't in or like the history and lore, he wouldn't be privy to as like a child growing up in this world. Um, and so it just never really felt genuine. And that's probably the biggest issue for me. Like I could never really like the story because I could never get into the world building because of well, the way it was presented. I'm not saying the author didn't go through the effort of like doing it. It's just that the way it came through is like, Oh, it didn't, it didn't work for me. It, it, it didn't make me uh, engage with the world itself. So like, so it was hard for me to like really appreciate it and 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 like the things that the main character was doing in that world. So those like that, that probably the biggest issue for me. Um, overall though, again, I like the action. I liked how much of a game of the main character came across as and the RPG stuff. All that was really nicely done. However, again, I just never connected with the motivation of the main character being there in the first place. I never connected with the real world or the game world, and so for me, it just didn't work. That's what it comes down to. Um, so that's Void Legion, a little RPG game. Let's talk the Frost Files, book number one, with the score of six out of ten. So there you go. And that's it. That's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you all very much for listening, for hanging out. Um, remember, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on our Patreon page, on on YouTube. We have all the links in the show notes. If you guys want to help support the podcast, just just follow us there. That's always a great way to to help support. It's like. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, all those different places because you can get the latest reviews from us. You get the latest podcast episodes, the latest video uh, versions of the show, and get all this stuff on a weekly basis. Um, and again, if you enjoy the podcast and we should perform, you can find all the ways to help support the podcast and keep it ad free and free for everybody at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. But until we can hang out again, ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks. Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, but until we can, remember to go read some Lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody.